Hello, I'm Luca Torix, and welcome to my Spain faction guide for Medieval 2 Total War. Today we're going to be discussing the faction of Spain, its units, and some campaign strategy for the Grand Campaign. So, Spain, as you would guess, starts off with settlements in now like Monde Iberia, Spain region. And they share that area with Portugal, which is the blue area here, either side of the Spanish settlements, and then the Moors to the south of Iberia sort of the southern tip of Iberia. So, this is a very interesting faction. In fact, Spain, you could argue, is one of the strongest, definitely, in terms of their unit roster. They definitely have a strong army. Their strengths are excellent naval units, light inf infantry, and cavalry. So, excellent in three, sort of, different units. Naval, light infantry, and cavalry. It weaknesses, lacks heavy infantry, and spears in the early period. But later on, a lot of that is resolved anyway. The long campaign hold 45 regions, including the Jerusalem region, along here, and the Granada region, which is Spain, so one of the Spanish settlements. So, we'll talk about where to expand first in a minute, but first of all, let's have a look at the Spanish units. So, over on the right are the Spanish units, and we'll start off, as we always do, with peasants. Yes, peasants are not amazing in any respect. Poor morale, four attack, three defense, very underwhelming, honestly, you're not going to use peasants for a huge amount other than cannon fodder, like it suggests there. So there's not really a huge amount to say about peasants. Then we move on to town militia. Again, another unit you'll hear about a lot if you watch my faction guides, because basically every faction has town militia. They are slightly better versions than the peasants. They have 5 attack, 7 defence. Being a militia unit, they're meant to sort of garrison towns more, so they're going to have that defence of 7, which is slightly higher. But honestly, not an amazing unit, would not rely on them, certainly not anywhere beyond the early game. Then we have the Swordsman Militia, trained levy troops equipped with light armour. So, 11 attack, 18 defence. So, 18 defence for light armoured troops, that's pretty good, I rate that definitely. No morale bonus, but a solid, solid swordsman unit, definitely. And then we go on to the Sword and Buckler Men, late period swordsmen, 13 attack, 19 defense. If we compare them, you can see that they have a slightly higher attack and defense than the previous unit. But of course, these guys have good morale and morale, very, very important. It means they're less likely to break and they're going to fight for longer, which can be very, very important in battles, definitely. Then we get on to the Pike Militia. Pike Militias, they range from armed peasants to semi-professional, well-trained and equipped soldiers. That's pretty vague. What isn't vague is their defence, which is one. Their defence is unequivocally bad, basically. But they can form a spear wall, so that kind of helps them a little bit. It means they are kind of more defensible just because of that. Bonus fighting cavalry, vulnerable to missiles because they basically have no armour. And they have very long spears, which means that the spears help. And again, very long spears always in total war is generally quite a good thing because it means that you can fight further away from the enemy the enemy has to get really close to you to actually do some damage but if they do get close to you like cavalry charge or with missiles then yeah that one defense you're gonna suffer a bit and they don't really pack that much of a punch seven attack not amazing now we get on to spear militia these are early period units of course five attack seven defense very very similar to the town militia Nothing incredible, but in the early game, you know, these guys are pretty cheap to maintain. They'll do an alright job, and they can do a skiltrum, which is similar to a phalanx. It's a nice defensive formation. Now, pronunciation might be a bit off here, but we have the Tercio Pikeman. So these guys, 11 attack, 4 defense, and a charge bonus of 4, which is pretty solid as well. They can form a spear wall, bonus fighting cavalry, because they're kind of like pikemen, so they would do. But with good morale and good stamina... Again, I really like the fact they have good morale and good stamina. But their defence, that's a little bit of an issue again. It makes them vulnerable to missiles. And these guys, they have very long spears. It's similar to what we were just talking about. They are hard to sort of get to. But if you actually do manage to attack them with a cavalry charge or uh, missiles, they will go down pretty quickly because they're not really armoured that well. But things do improve because we have dismounted feudal knights. Now, these guys have an attack of 13 and a defense of 21 so it definitely goes up here and you can see the difference in the defense purely because this geese actually has a helmet on he's bothered to bring armor to the fight and a, and a shield like that generally helps so good morale well armored they're not vulnerable to missiles unlike some of these guys because they actually have some good defensive equipment on so yeah they're, they're pretty solid indeed they make excellent heavy infantry like the game suggests then we have dismounted chivalric knights so more dismounted troops 
13 attack, 22 defense, so very slightly higher. Good morale, well armored. Obviously, you can just look at them, they are well armored. And these guys are, as the game says again, formidable. They very good defensive unit, but they also pack a punch with the sword as well. So for swordsmen to have defense of 22, yeah, I quite like that indeed. Then we have dismounted conquistadors. Yes, lovely. A 16 attack, so definitely an upgrade from that. 22 defense. Well armoured, very good stamina, good morale. These guys are going to be hard to break down. And again, they can pack a punch. They can. They are capable of devastating attacks, like the game says. And these are just going to be hard to chunk through. Armour gets more and more important as the game goes along because you start going against armour-piercing troops, like missile troops and whatever. But these guys can still stand up to a lot of damage. And they can deal a lot of damage as well. So some really quite good stuff here. Now we have the missile troops, so the peasant crossbowmen we'll start off with. Now, peasant crossbowmen, nothing amazing, but honestly, missile attack of 9 isn't even that bad. That's pretty solid for an early game unit. Obviously, completely useless in the melee, because not only are they peasants, but they're crossbowmen, so that's not what they're used for. But, you know, melee, that's not something you're going to have to worry about too much, is the missiles, and to be honest... I, I, I quite like these guys. You put them on a nice bit of high ground on the wall and they'll do a good bit of damage. But again, they're vulnerable to missiles themselves because of a distinct lack of armour. Then we have the crossbow militia. Pretty similar, to be honest. A 9 missile attack as well. 2 attack, 1 defence in the melee. So not a huge amount more to add on from these two. They're pretty similar units. Now we have the peasant archers. Now the peasant archers aren't as good as the peasant crossbowmen. They have basically the same attack and defense in the melee but their missile attack is four lower it's a five missile attack because they are is a bow and arrow as opposed to a crossbow so it's going to be less effective obviously they can use flaming missiles which is cool but these guys aren't going to do a huge amount of damage even then though again if you put them on the wall they could just do a little bit but definitely won't do anything to armored troops that's for sure then we have the javelin men now the javelin men actually have a higher missile attack than the peasant crossbowmen, sorry, the peasant archers, not the peasant crossbowmen, the peasant archers, which is quite interesting, but they are more effective in the melee. Six attack, six defense, nothing amazing, but sometimes javelin men, you know, if they run out of javelins, all that, they can be a bit useless. These guys will do a all right job in the melee, but honestly, nothing spectacular. They're not melee troops, of course. Still, they, they can do a bit of damage with the skirmishing, they can harass the enemy, and that's kind of what they're good for, skirmishers. Now, I, mean, I've, I've, I think I've been told how to pronounce these guys, and I still don't know. I think I'm saying it right. Arcabuziers, or something like that. Either way, you, you can read. I can't, apparently. But these guys, much higher missile attack, 14. So the peasant archers had a missile attack of 5. So this is almost triple that. They're actually slightly competent in the melee because they've got a 6 attack rather than like a 2 attack. But still, again, don't rely on them. They haven't actually got armor or anything like that. But the missile attack of 14, that's pretty solid. They fire the close range weapon and the noise and the smoke, like the game says, will cause morale damage. So you're kind of getting a sort of double attack. You're getting the attack of the physical attack, which is 14, but also a morale debuff, which is really, really important in battles. And again, morale can really tide the it can really turn the tides of a battle very, very quickly. So for a missile unit to have such an effect on the morale of the opposition, that's great. Then we have the Paviz Crossbowman. 6 attack, 14 defense. Now for a missile troop, 14 defense is pretty good. You can see none of these guys have anywhere near 14 defense. They're like in the 2, 3, 4 region. 14 defense, pretty, pretty solid indeed. Missile attack of 12. And as I've mentioned many times before, long range missiles, real asset in the game because it means that you can start getting hits on the enemy before they can get hits on you. So you've got a free attack basically on them. It's really, really good to have long range missiles. I go on about Cretan archers a lot in Rome Total War because they're, they're long range missiles. And this is kind of similar in that respect that they are very, very well ranged troops. Definitely a lot longer range than these geezers. So yeah, and a 12th missile attack with a crossbow, pretty solid, pretty solid indeed. Then we have the musketeers. So the musket is an improved form of firearm, firing a heavy shot to a good range, so a higher range than these geezers. Good range, so they have long range missiles, they're vulnerable to missiles themselves because they have poor defense, but you're not gonna be fighting in the melee particularly, so shouldn't be too bad. And the missile attack of 14 is pretty solid indeed, not too bad at all. Then we have uh, the pronunciation uh, off the scale. Almugavars, I know I said that wrong, I'm not Spanish, so please forgive me. Anyway, 
elite light infantry skirmishers armed with javelins and spears and sometimes armor now i like these guys javelins with a missile attack of 13 that is pretty amazing i mean that's rare to see javelin men with such a high missile attack and as i said javelin men they're more effective in archers in the sense that they are good at skirmishing better they can harass the enemy more get them tired they're faster than archers so javelin men to have a missile attack of 13 which is comparable with some of the higher crosswomen over here that's that's pretty cool indeed and again they're actually competent in the melee attack of 12 defense of 8 i mean in, in the late late game they're not gonna then they're not gonna go toe to toe with obviously like swordsmen like these but still they're not gonna melt straight away and again good morale coupled with that kind of emphasizes that point a bit more so i, I quite like these guys and as it says here they have spears they're not just javelin men because this is something you notice a lot if you use javelin men a lot as soon as they run out their javelins they're useless well not these guys they actually have spears they're not completely incompetent in the melee and that's what i like about them a lot then we have hand gunners earliest handheld firearm unit causes more fear than actual damage these soldiers need to be capable in close combat due to the short range of their weapons now 13 missile attack is pretty solid but again they're really really short range it's not joking attack of 11 defense of 13 so definitely better than some of the other units we looked at because as the game explains they are going to be fighting close combat even if they are missile troop now i'm not a big fan of missile troops that are so short range but it's the, the good thing about these guys is the morale debuff which as i've already explained is hugely important so that's why they're kind of used now we'll get on to the cavalry a major major strength of the spanish i mean they've got some really good cavalry up here which we'll talk about in a second but we start off with merchant cavalry militia six attack 14 defense now they're poorly trained but they're actually well equipped as it says here they fight with a sword and 14 defense not too bad for cavalry they are well armored and you know i believe you can get these guys quite early on in the early game and again for militia cavalry to have 14 defense that's very very good you see other militia cavalry with nine eight defense so to start off with 14 defense and well armored that's that's excellent they can stand up to a lot more don't really pack a huge punch but that's not really what they're for to be honest then we have mailed knights 10 attack, 14 defense, and a charge bonus of 6. And again, good morale, which is really, really cool for cavalry. Good morale is very, you know, not a lot of cavalry has good morale. Not a huge amount of cavalry has good morale. And then cased in mail, equipped with lances, they're definitely going to be able to fight for longer without breaking. And a lot of cavalry just melts if they're in a really long, sort of protracted melee. So the fact that these guys can stand up a little bit more in the early game is certainly an asset. Then we have the Feudal Knights, slightly better. They have a defense of 16. They may charge without orders, which is something I don't particularly like, but, you know, sometimes you have to deal with it with less well-trained armies like this. But still, they, their attack of 10 coupled with the charge bonus of 6 means they'll certainly do a good job. And if they do charge without orders, at least they've got good morale, well-armored, and good stamina. Now we'll get on to a more bloody pronunciation. Gendarmes? I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, superb, well-armoured, professional, heavy cavalry, armed with a lance. So I was just saying about cavalry, which is less professional. Well, these guys are professional. Attack of 10, defence of 15, charge bonus of 8. That's the highest we've seen so far. Good morale, very well-armoured, and a powerful charge, like I said there. So, that very well-armoured cavalry. These guys are very, very solid indeed. And it's their charge. And cavalry with a very powerful charge like that, they really can turn the tide of a battle because one, sometimes it literally just takes one heavy cavalry charge into a back of the unit to get them routing. And if another unit routes and another unit, you can get a mass route going on. And this is the kind of troop which will incite a mass route from the opposition. So definitely any troop which has a good charge bonus like this, you've, you've got to use them. Good stuff. And you've got to use them sensibly though. Don't waste these geezers. Then we have the early period general's bodyguard. Obviously, they're here to protect the general. 13 attack, 16 defense. They're going to be good. The general has two hit points and a charge bonus of eight. So again, these guys can certainly be effective in battle, but be careful with charging in because you don't want your general to die. Powerful charge, well-armored, very good stamina. So a very solid unit indeed. And then we have the late period general's bodyguard. Basically just a boost to the old defense so the general is less likely to die, which is a good thing in general, I would say, yes. 
Then we have the, oh, I love these, Knights of Santiago. Based in Spain, the Knights of Santiago are charged with driving the Moors from Iberia. I mean, you just got to love that. 13 attack, 16 defense, so, and a charge bonus of 8. So, the attack and the charge bonus combined, 21. That's, that's pretty good for cavalry. I mean, that's up... You know, that's up higher than some of these guys are doing. So really, really good cavalry here. They can form a wedge. Good morale. Again, a powerful charge. This is cavalry which can really pack a punch and um, can really turn the tide of a battle. And that's really awesome to see. Love that. Then we have the Conquistadors. Well trained and armed with a lance and sword. They make superb heavy cavalry capable of devastating attacks. 17 defense is very, very high. Again, 13 attack. Six charge. I, I cannot stress how good this cavalry is. It's it's really cool stuff. So I'm just going to move on before I keep repeating myself. And we're going to go on to Chivalric Knights. So these guys are good because they are clad in steel plate armor. Capable of a ferocious charge. They may charge their orders. But I, as I say, you know, if a unit charges their orders, if, if, they, if they're going to charge, charge properly. And these guys will charge properly. So... Then we have Mounted Crossbowmen. So we're getting on to the Missile Cavalry now. Now, the Missile Attack of 5 isn't amazing, but you've got to remember this is like Missile Cavalry, so they're not going to have a really high Missile Attack like some of the other guys we've had a look at. But still, 7 Attack, 10 Defense. They're okay in the melee. Nothing hugely spectacular, but a solid unit. Nothing too bad at all. And then we have these guys. Now, the, I think they're called Jeanettes. These guys are good. And, uh, you know, I've done a bit of research online. People love these guys, and I don't blame them because actually... The javelin men I was saying are a strength of the Spanish. I've definitely noticed that. And we'll talk about these guys for a moment. They are fast and manoeuvrable light cavalry with a missile attack of 8. And again, as I was saying, javelin men with a missile attack of 8, that's pretty good indeed, especially for early period cav um, javelins. That's very, very good. You put them on a horse, make them fast moving, they're even better because they can har harass the enemy, get them tired, and inflict some really quite solid damage. Then, you give them an attack of 9 and a de defense of 15, and they're just off the scale good, particularly for early period cavalry. These guys are just amazing, because they're competent in the melee. So, again, as, as I was saying, javelinmen often, if they run out of javelins, they're useless. Not with these guys, because they can actually stand the ground in the melee. Charge bones of 3 for jav cav, that's good. Good stamina, which you need. They're effective against armor in the early game. And they're fast moving. I cannot stress how good these guys are. Really fantastic unit. A major strength of Spain. Definitely. Really rate these guys. Now we're going to go on to... Well, I've covered the siege equipment before. It's pretty much the same for all the factions. So, I believe I talked about it in the England faction guide. So, if you want to know about Ballista and all this stuff, go over to the England faction guide. I talked about it over there. I don't want to repeat myself every single faction guide. So, yeah. Go check that out. So we've looked at all these Spanish units now. Definitely a strong roster, particularly of cavalry. I really rate it. And now we're going to go on to some campaign strategy. So I'll see you in a minute. Okay, so here we are, the Spanish campaign. Now what I'm going to do instantly is turn off the Fog of War. I don't play with the Fog of War off, but it's just so I can show you what's around. It's a lot easier to explain stuff if the Fog of War's off. But as I say, don't normally play with the Fog of War off. I consider it cheating. So I'm just going to quickly do that now. Beautiful. So now we can see exactly what's going on. So you start off with two settlements, Leon and Toledo. I think I'm saying them right. Please don't shoot me if I said it wrong. You've got a castle here, so pretty defensible settlement. And you've got this, the capital, which is actually Leon over here. Now, the, the, the priority for me anyway is just capture the rebel settlements before anyone else does. Because really, the Spanish campaign in the early game is similar to Portugal and it's kind of similar to the Moors. It's slightly different from the Moors. But these factions, the main purpose is got to be unifying Spain. So as the Spanish, you you really want to just unify what is now modern day Spain. And the first thing you've got to do is take the rebel settlements. Because if Portugal gets their hands on Zaragoza and Valencia, or if the Moors do it, then you're going to have trouble instantly. You're going to have trouble instantly because you're just going to be on the back foot. The Portuguese or the Moors, they're going to be stronger than you. And why would you let them get the settlements? They're, they're easier settlements to get. Valencia maybe is a little bit difficult. It's a wooden castle and it's relatively well defended. So you should really probably bring your strongest army over towards Valencia. But Zaragoza, it's just a town. There's only four units in it. 
make sure you get it before the Portuguese do, because the Portuguese are near us at Zaragoza, so you need to go quickly. You know, you can even kind of, you can even sneak Bordeaux if you're feeling brave, but I probably wouldn't do that to be honest. Priorities got to be Zaragoza and Valencia. So once you've taken those two, which should be pretty simple, it shouldn't be too difficult. You now need to decide what you're going to do with the rest of Iberia because you need to take it. You need to take Granada down here at some point to fulfil the long campaign rules. So you need to take Granada, but also you need to make sure that the Portuguese are under control. So you've kind of got a choice and it's kind of conflicting whether you choose to focus on the Portuguese or the Moors first. If you're really experienced, you can go for both, but honestly, probably wouldn't recommend that unless you really know what you're doing. I would focus on either the Portuguese or the Moors first. So... The thing is, you don't want to let the Portuguese get too strong because if you if the Portuguese are around for too long, they're going to get technologically advanced and the more technologically advanced they get, the more dangerous they get because once the Portuguese get their hands on some of the higher level stuff, they are really quite tricky to deal with and you, you don't want to, to have that problem. So you could argue that you want to sort of nip that problem in the bud and just deal with the Portuguese instantly. Go for Pamplona. Bear in mind you'll have armies near Zaragoza and Valencia. So that should be relatively easy to do that. It is a castle. But you should have a decent amount of force in that region by the time you've dealt with the rebels. And then go for Lisbon. Which is the capital. And relatively well defended. But you want to make sure that it gets, it doesn't get stronger. So just go over there and deal with it quickly. The problem with dealing with the Portuguese first is the Portuguese are Catholic. So you might get a bit of trouble from the Pope. But as long as you don't mind a little bit of trouble from the Pope, you might be excommunicated for a while, but trust me, it's worth it. Excommunication is worth it in the long run because you don't want to be all, oh, I'm nice friends with the Portuguese and then they screw you later because they're actually really quite strong now. So if you, let's say you decide, I want to be friends with the Portuguese, then get an alliance with the Moors. If you decide you want to go for the Moors because you don't want to get excommunicated and you want to take Granada and Cordoba, which is fine. If you want to do that, that's fine. Make sure you get an alliance with the Portuguese. You will break the alliances either way, but you need to make sure you get an alliance because let's say, for example, you're really focused on the Portuguese. You've got a lot of troops in Pamplona. You've got a lot of troops in Lisbon. You don't want the Moors thinking, OK, we'll go and sneak in Toledo and take the castle off you. And now they've got a castle which is really highly defensible. You don't, or vice versa, you don't want to go for the Moors and the Portuguese stab you in the back and take Leon, for example. So you need to be careful that you don't get dogpiled too quickly. But, it, it, you know, you, I would definitely get an alliance so that you distract the, the other faction. So the Moors might think, OK, I'm going to go and take Timbuktu and make millions of dollars, which is probably what they're going to do. That's fine, as long as they're not attacking you. You can deal with them later. So let's say you've now taken the Portuguese settlements. So Portugal are out of the issue. Bear in mind, Portugal only start off with two settlements, like yourself. So taking up Portugal shouldn't be too difficult. And it shouldn't take too long either, hopefully, particularly taking Pamplona. So you've dealt with the Portuguese. Now it's time to backstab the Moors. You're going to have to at some point, as I said, inevitably, because you need to take Granada. And at this point, you can focus on the Moors. You'll get a little bit of respite from the whole excommunication thing because you're actually you're actually taking on a Muslim faction. So the Pope will probably like that and you can just get a little bit of respite. So then then focus on the Moors. Take Cordoba, take Granada. That means you've satisfied one of the terms of the long campaign already. So you don't have to worry about that later on in the game. And now we've unified Spain. Now the reason why Spain have got a really strong starting position is and a really strong faction overall is because they've got good units but also... Once you've unified Spain, that's, that's the tricky bit at the beginning. Once you've unified Spain, really highly defensible place. Because nobody's going to be coming from this side. Nobody likely is going to be coming from this side because there's sea to defend you. The Moors, they're going to be on the back foot once you've taken Cordoba and Granada. And then their settlements, Marrakesh, they're really far away from each other like this. So it's going to take a while for them to mobilise against you for a counter-attack. And then here, against the France, you've got the Alps. So although the French could come and attack you, first of all, they're Catholics, they're less likely to. And they're probably going to be dealing with the, the English or the Holy Roman Empire. They're not going to be bothered by you. You've got the Alps as a nice sort of defensible region like this. Now, the question is afterwards what you want to do once you've unified Spain. And that's sort of a matter of subjectivity. You could go for the Moors. I don't particularly like going for North Africa purely because there's literally three settlements across all of this distance. Now, that 
mountainous desert region takes a long time to get across. So you could spend a huge amount of time and effort and money taking Marrakesh and Algiers and then eventually Tunis, which by the way could have fallen into Sicilian hands by that point, which will be cause more trouble. You could take ages and ages of time and money for three settlements. That's it. It's not really worth it. I would probably, if you're feeling brave enough, go for France. Because France, as I just said, they're going to be going for the English and the Holy Roman Empire probably. They're going to have trouble, I reckon, at some point. So you can start sneaking some of these settlements off them and sort of stabbing them in the back. But, you know, that's sort of worrying about that later on. The priority definitely is unifying Spain, getting rid of the Portuguese early on, getting the rebel settlements early on, and then getting rid of the Moors. So I think they've basically summarised that pretty well, if I say so myself. So anyway, that's sort of my advice. You can take it or leave it. But um, yeah, that's that's basically what's happening. So next up, I'm going to be doing the faction guide for the Holy Roman Empire, which will be out relatively soon. And then I believe I promised to do Denmark after that. So yeah, I've got a long list of basically people requesting certain factions. I will get all the factions done, but I'm going to do Holy Roman Empire next, as that is what was requested. So thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you around.